Hey guys, it's Danny. Today we're gonna make a Q&A session. It's been a while, right? So I'm gonna try to answer as many questions as I can that you guys left in the comment section of my videos in the past week or so, maybe a little more, judging by how long my answers are. Yeah, but let's not waste time and get to work. And the first question comes from Terry, who is saying that orchids are just so, so delicate. So much that she's getting frustrated with it. She's saying that the flowers dropped, but the leaves continue to grow and the new buds, I'm not entirely sure which buds she's referring, are really vibrant green. Maybe the root tips. Is there any luck for it? Of course it is. Actually, orchids grow when they're not in bloom the most. They have, let's say, two periods generally, and I'm guessing you're referring to a Phalaenopsis orchid. A period in which they will create the flower spike and they will open the flowers. This is usually the moment in which we find them at the flower shops and of course the moment we enjoy the most, but they also have another stage, that of actual growth. When an orchid is in bloom, it does grow, but not actively, not at the speed it can grow without flowers. When the flowers are gone is when new leaves will start to form, new roots will start to grow, everything pretty much explodes with growth when the flowers are gone. So flowers are a bit of a burden to be fully honest. Yes, the main goal of the orchid is to produce flowers and to propagate itself. This is for the good of the species, but for the good of the individual, actually it's much better without flowers because we have energy for these lovely leaves and the roots, which will make sure that the plant will survive. So I'll link it down below to my Orchid Care for Beginners series. I do talk a little bit more about the maintenance and what you should do with your orchid, especially after the blooms fall. So check it out in case you're new to my channel and you didn't um, see that series. It's absolutely fine what's going on after the flower spikes dry out and the flowers fade. That's when the orchid becomes more active and the growth you see, whether it's roots or leaves, is a very, very good sign. And with good care, your orchid will definitely bloom in the future again. Jan is saying that they have a feeling I'm kind of frustrated with Leka at the moment, with the pH situation, with the water absorbency and all of the issues we've kind of experienced or discovered along the way. Could I clarify or expand a little bit on this? Yes, absolutely. I actually wanted to address it in a video, maybe a separate video, but since you asked, I guess um, it's fitted to respond here. Yes, I'm very frustrated with Leka because it just doesn't work the way I want it to work unless I work for it. And given that up until now, I just did not have the time. Yeah, it's weird to say I don't have time, but I absolutely didn't. I didn't have the time or the focus to invest in a different watering system, preparing the Leka and always using a pH down solution when I water, which I do. But all of these things, they were frustrating because I was just not in a calm place, to be fully honest. So I got upset with it, very upset. And for the Oncidiums, Paphiopetalums and a few others, which you can see here, I just switched. And that is that, end of story. I just could not tolerate it. I'll link it down below to some videos about the Oncidiums and the issues and the Paphiopetalums and their issues so you see more of what I'm talking about. If you don't know the story, I had leaf tip die back. I just didn't like the way they acted with the Leka for various reasons, drying out mainly and also the pH issue. But it's just as true that some orchids have absolutely no issue with Leka and with these guys I'm in no hurry to change anything. To be fully honest, I just want to relax in the next weeks from this point of view. So it really depended on the orchid. I find that the Cattleyas, not all of them, but most of them, they do okay with the Leka. I do see sometimes if I'm not on point with lowering the pH of my water, I see them. I see that they would like a little bit more nitrogen or something. I see it in their leaves. But when I'm on point with altering the pH, they do okay. The question is, do I want to continue this routine or not? With some I do, with some I don't. Um, that's pretty much what it boils down to because in the end, everything has drawbacks. Even my precious sphagnum moss, at some point it degrades and it needs changing and oh my, I don't wanna think about how many repottings, how much uh, money I will spend on it and so on. Yeah, it has to happen, that's that. Leka doesn't need changing, but it needs altering of pH, at least the brand that I'm using. So there is no perfect solution or medium, it's just what you can live with pretty much. And with some orchids, with Leka, I just couldn't take it anymore, to be fully honest with you. I just could not watch them one more day in Leka because I didn't like what I was seeing. So pretty much that's why I switched. 
Now to clarify a little bit the Leka situation, I don't believe all brands are the same. I have heard from one of my viewers that there is a brand of Leka which puts peat inside in the center of the uh, clay bead just to maintain the pH lower. That is great. I mean, I've never seen it on the market, never heard of it, but if it exists, you know, obviously some other people had some issues that are trying to fix. Until further notice, I'm going back to what I was used to before the clay medium and thinking of other solutions in the background. I don't know, we'll see. For now, really, I kind of want a break of just of repotting and stuff. I will just try out with one or two or three orchids, some new products and that's it. For now, I just need a break to be fully honest. But that's the whole story with the Leka. As much as I wanted to work with some orchids, it just doesn't work for me. But if you Google other people's results, they're amazing. I see on Cidiums doing amazing in Leka. So it absolutely can be done. And all of those pictures, they made me try out the system and it kind of worked for a while. But long term, it wasn't the best for me. And that's it. I'm sad that it doesn't work for me and that I still have to buy and repot orchids. But that's how it is. I tried it. I'm happy I tried it. And I'm happy that some people do actually have success with it. I'm not happy it didn't work for me, but that is that. We move on, right? So that's the whole story with the Leka. France is asking if I'm observing calcium deficiencies or other deficiency or stress signs on the mature cattleyas. This is on yesterday's video, so if you missed it, check it down below. I updated you guys on the cattleya seedlings where I had some calcium deficiencies. And the answer is no. On the mature cattleyas, I have no signs of calcium deficiency. I have freckles on the orchids, which naturally have freckles, but that's it. It has nothing to do with deficiencies. And this is because mature orchids don't necessarily have to grow bigger and bigger growths. They also are prone to having more nutrients uh, piled up in the older growths. So there is no reason for me to have deficiencies. But if you can imagine, a seedling always has to create a bigger growth from very, very tiny, let's say, deposits. So seedlings do need more attention and more adequate nutrient regime, let's say, in that period of their life, simply because they don't have enough stocked up and they should actually grow fast. But the mature orchids, there's no reason for them to have deficiencies, and I don't, actually. I've never had issues with the mature cattleyas, it's only the seedlings. Next question comes from Julian. They're asking if I would advise microwaving moss or bark to sterilize it before use. They say they had the really odd root rot, which they're thinking could come from spores in the sphagnum moss or the orchiara bark. Okay, that's a very good question. And I kind of wanted to address again the subject in a way. Let's talk about it here. Maybe I'll do a separate video on sterilizing media generally. Um, you might know already that I'm not a fan of sterilizing media. First of all, if you're boiling organic medium, you will degrade it much, much, much faster because you're destroying the structures. It will retain much more water and it will just break down very, very fast. Trust me, I did it. No, in two months it was done. My fresh medium was done. So I would never advise boiling it. Microwaving it or baking it, that's a different story. So microwaving, I'm not sure if I would advise it because, do you know ants can survive microwaving? I don't know why they do. Maybe they hide in locations where the waves don't reach. Maybe they're just immune. I don't know. I don't know. But they do survive tested. So if ants survive, what else can survive? You know what I'm saying? And if you put in wet medium to microwave it, you are doing the exact same thing as boiling. So no, not a good idea to microwave wet medium. Dry medium, sure, if it makes you feel better, microwave it, see if it helps. If you stop having issues, sure, why not? But make sure it's dry. I personally don't microwave it, but I don't know it all, so there's no harm in trying, right? Baking, on the other hand, that's a little better because it applies heat everywhere, so whatever you have in that medium will completely be destroyed. However, even with baking, I believe there is a slight degradation there, and I just believe that the medium will not be as long-lasting. But this I haven't experienced. I know boiling does very horrible things to the medium, but I'm not sure about baking. You can try, but don't bake big amounts. Just try it with one orchid and see what effects all of these things have. I will one day do all of these experiments and see and show you actually what happens when you sterilize media in certain ways. Um, but the problem is I don't have an oven. That is just one of the things because we don't actually have a separate kitchen. It's together with the living room. It's a very tiny like apartment and kitchen. And Bendy was in the living room, so we couldn't cook. 
I digress, I'm sorry. But yeah, there we have it. I will one day do all of these videos, but I need to buy an oven first. Solon has a question regarding Lekka once again. Do I think that negative results in Lekka became more pronounced because of the increase in heat plus dryness or because of summer? That is a very good question as well. And no, it's paradoxical. But in the summertime, I actually had better results with the Lekka simply because water evaporated faster and I would just watch for it more often. In winter, oh boy, things didn't go well in winter. Not because of the excessive water, but because of the dryness and not because of the dryness in the air. Ugh, it's complicated. So imagine that I would water once, the reservoir would get like this, full, but then it wouldn't actually drop very fast because it wasn't hot um, in the grow room. It was pretty cold. So it would take a month for the reservoir, let's say, to empty. And in that time, I obviously didn't water the orchid, but the problem was the top was super dry while the bottom was super wet. So there was no evaporation there to help the leka um, get the water to the surface. So what I used to do is just go and check, lift up and see what's in the reservoir, dump the reservoir, water the orchid, but I have, I think over 300 orchids. Obviously I couldn't do that for everybody. So that was frustrating. In the winter time, I actually had more issues with dryness, dehydration, desiccation, uh, root tips at the top issues than in summertime, simply because in summer I watered more frequently. And in the end, I could have solved my Leka issues simply by watering more frequent. If only I had an automated system, I did not have time to do that. So that is that. Now that I'm spoiled with the moss, I don't know if I would just go back to the semi-hydro, give it another go and just water more often. Uh, but yeah, that was one of the issues that I had in winter time and it all had to do with the frequency of watering. But of course in summertime, this can happen as well. For me, the summer was a little better than winter paradoxically enough. Chanteuse has a question regarding Aciderea japonica on a setup with a piece of styrofoam packing peanut at the base of the stem in a uh, fully sphagnum moss medium. What do I think about the setup? I know you're not a fan of peanuts generally. Well, the thing is I love peanuts, just not the packing ones. So the packing peanut in the middle, its purpose is to just keep in the air there and the moisture out. If that's what you want to do, if that's what you're aiming, yeah, it's going to do that. It's going to be okay if that's what you want to have. If, however, you want to have moisture constantly everywhere and very evenly, the packing peanut will be in the way. In some environments, having more ventilation, especially in the center of the pot, is a good thing. While in other environments, such as mine, having ventilation in the center means desiccated roots in the center. And that's how it goes. <laughs> that's how the cookie crumbles. Was that a friend's quote? I think so. So there's nothing wrong with the setup and generally there's nothing wrong with many setups. It's just about how it works. Do you think that in your environment you would benefit from having a very, very ventilated center? If yes, then absolutely keep it. There's no problem with it. And packing peanuts, if it's not the organic one, will not decompose. It will just remain there. But if your environment is rather dry or hot, you might actually have to water way too often that orchid. So if you're not sure at the moment, if it's a new orchid, then just let it be as it is, see how it goes, try to do your best with watering the orchid. And probably in a month or two, you will notice if the setup works for you really. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with peanuts. I don't like them because they make things dry. And that's the last thing that my orchids need in this environment. But there's nothing inherently wrong with them. So you can use them. I would never actually use them at the bottom unless you don't have the proper pot, the proper size of the pot. Let's say you want this size, but your pot is like this. One way to trick the size of the pot is to put packing peanuts at the bottom. And that way it would be just like you would have a small pot but it's actually bigger. I'm not sure if people use it because of that or because they didn't really find out that sphagnum moss is really absorbent and it doesn't layer. I'm not sure. I think some people didn't notice yet that sphagnum moss doesn't layer and that's why they put the packing peanuts at the bottom to avoid extra water at the bottom. And well, you don't have to worry about that with sphagnum moss, so maybe don't use them. Maybe use the appropriate size pot. Uh, but in the middle, I can see it function. I can see how it's put there to maintain the ventilation in the middle. So just give it a go, see how it goes. Maybe it's gonna work out good for you. 
Shigatom has a question about a Phalaenopsis orchid and I'm hoping I understood your question correctly. So you have an orchid which is missing the top leaf, it bloomed and then the flower spike uh, dried up and now it's producing a basal keiki. So you're thinking the crown is damaged but you want to know if you should remove the keiki when it's big enough just in case. Yes, you could remove it. If the mother plant is not limpy and the infection doesn't really go down, the roots are okay, everything is okay. The mother plant might actually have a damaged crown, case in which it will not produce any more leaves, but that's okay, doesn't mean it will wither off straight away. It will, however, put its energy into that basal keiki, and the fact that you do have a basal keiki might mean that the crown is affected. Now, as it grows, the keiki will depend on its mother, but once it has big enough roots of its own, it's okay, you can actually separate them. You can also leave them be. Actually, I have a case, actually. Alrighty, so this is my Schillerianna. This is a keiki and this used to be the mother plant. It stopped growing more than a year ago, to be fully honest, and it started to invest its energy into this keiki. And the mother plant was absolutely fine. It had roots, but it's slowly and surely it is actually losing its leaves. I don't know entirely why the mother plant decided to abandon ship, uh, but as you can see, all its energy went into the basal keiki. So you can leave the mother plant be for a while, see what it does. Eventually, if the crown is damaged, it will probably lose its leaves just like this. It might actually create another keiki, who knows? As long as it has roots, it will survive. But yeah, definitely at some point you can uh, separate the keiki and I think it will be a good video to make with me separating the keiki from this mother plant. The keiki has roots, by the way. Um, so let me know if you want me to make that video. But yeah, you can absolutely separate the keiki when it has long enough roots. But I don't think there is any reason to hurry if the mother plant looks okay. Mateo is asking if I ever thought of creating one of my own personal hybrids, orchid hybrids. Ah, yeah, I think everybody thinks about that. But the thing is, it's not so easy. It's not like taking pollen from this orchid, putting it in another orchid, get the seeds, put them in soil, and voila, another orchid. It actually is a lot more complicated than that. I'll share with you down below a video that I made a long time ago talking about how orchid seeds are sown. It is quite the process. Nowadays, there are actually nurseries which accept seed pods that you create and they grow them for you for a few years until the orchid reaches a let's say decent size for you to get it back and grow it. So I am super, super, super tempted to do that. Yeah, it's a long-term thing. I need to find out which nurseries in my area in my or on my continent actually does that. If you guys know, let me know down below because it's a project that I might actually do pretty soon. Uh, I wanted to do this with the telumnias, but I lost my telumnias because they grow faster. But yeah, I am tempted to do um, some hybrids. So at some point I will try to create my hybrid. It's gonna be so fun. But when I decide to and when I will get results, those moments will be very, very far apart. And a last question coming from Dari. They say they have two keikis on an orchid and they both decided to produce flower spikes at the same time. The mother plant's leaves are looking limp and starting to wilt and discolor. Do I cut and repot the keikis or repot the mother plant? I would definitely, definitely try to remove the keikis because the mother plant is obviously overwhelmed. Not only do the keikis consume a lot of energy from the mother plant, but also their flower spikes. It's double the energy consumption. But I will have to say that the keikis should have roots. If they don't have roots, chances are they're not going to produce them in time to actually maintain them alive especially if they have flower spikes, which will not drain the mother plant anymore, but will drain them. So it's a very sensitive or delicate situation you are in. If the mother plant has roots, then she will recover after you remove the keikis. But if the keikis don't have roots, then I'm not sure if they will survive. Hopefully they do have roots. If they do, just remove them and I think everything should be solved. But the moment the keikis do have some roots which can absorb water, it's time to go. No more point in letting them on the mother plant, particularly if the mother plant is suffering. And that's about it for today. Hope you've enjoyed this video and learned something new. And please observe the beauty of my nails. <laughs> They're done. I haven't done my nails in months. And if I did, I took them off the next day. The reason is Milo hated my nails. That's why I stopped making my nails. If you look at my older videos, you'd see I have some nail art even. 
Well, due to lack of time and um, a very, very vocal and opposant parrot, I stopped doing my nails. Yeah, there are so, so many things that I'm discovering now that were just revolving and done because of him. And you probably will notice this in my videos as well. You know, at the end, it doesn't matter, does it? It's just nail polish. Who needs nail polish, to be honest? Um, I'm in a much better place now. I'm healing and it's good to, to focus on orchids. I want to thank you again for your thoughts and for your comments. I removed that video because it was hard seeing it in the, in the list. And I said what I wanted to say and share. And that is it. And it's good. I'm good now. I miss him like, like hell, to be honest. But I'm also seeing or trying to see some of the things that I was kind of missing out. Now I can light a scented candle in the living room. I couldn't. <laughs> or I can um, cut onion in the living room or actually in the kitchen, which is connected to the living room. I couldn't before. Uh, and, you know, all of these things that never really mattered and they still don't matter. But, you know, doing them, I'm trying to see that hey, this is okay too, this this will work, this will be okay. Alrighty, let's end this video uh, tomorrow, big announcement, you'll see. Uh, hope you will like it. So until then, you know the drill, like or dislike this video below, subscribe to my channel for regular orchid videos, tutorials, Q&As and other fun orchid subjects. And if you wish to support the channel, do consider visiting the merch store down below in the description, you have links. With that said, I'll see you guys tomorrow, bye.